Like, am I tasting my food? Am I on my phone while I'm eating? Am I not like, am I, am I multitasking too much? You know, am I taking in each action? Mm -hmm. And then I think for me, that mindfulness banner, what, how I manifest it is taking personal responsibility, Mm -hmm. right? Teacher's like, okay, everybody, all right, uh, pop quiz time. We're going to do the uh, vocabulary to it. And I just yell out, wait, I got to make my cheat sheet. I like to joke that I make my living throwing away pe- dead people's sex toys. <laughs> I can guarantee you there is nothing you have felt that I haven't felt. Yeah, and um, I, I am a formerly miserable person. If people don't know how you are, they cannot help you. Anxiety is the rattling of the lid on the pot of boiling water. Mm-hmm. Everything is connected, like me letting go of the past, me not hanging on to my anger, me like trying to become a present being. You're not in your peak dieting phase now. (laughs) I mean, I was was only in it for like a quick six minutes on a car ride once (laughs) because there's no, I was in between. Can we stop for snacks? (laughs) Yeah, I was equidistant between two fast food places. So So that if I'm in a situation with like my older daughter and she says something hurtful to me, like you're wearing a lot of statement jewelry right now. In the very, very niche world of American ghost towning. Uh, my dad is a minor celebrity. Well, we have 50% of the country's in dire poverty, is in homelessness. You know, LA is 50% of the country is in homelessness. Uh, that seems like a, not a correct statistic. Hey, it's Sean, and this is Sean Conroy Gets Happier. I'm in my apartment in Hollywood. Uh, I believe today is the 10th day i'm on the evening of the 10th day in which i have not even left my apartment uh or no i guess that's not true i went to the mailbox once last week and i put the garbage out uh but i need to go to the supermarket soon anyway i'm by myself all the time um i've had a couple of roommates over the years luckily i don't have one right now And I am glad about that. I feel like this would be a stressful situation. Back in the late 90s, I did live with a woman. Uh, Thank you. And, you know, like many relationships in my life about which I have been wrong, I thought this one was going somewhere, so I moved in with her. We lasted in that apartment together about a year. Uh, I would call her sometimes. This is back when people still spoke on the phone long before Zoom rooms. So I would call her and as soon as I got her on the phone, she would start making excuses about why she had to get off. It always struck me as very strange. Eventually it became a real problem in our relationship. I'd be like, hey, I'm just, I just want to talk to you. And she'd immediately would be like, well, I'm very busy right now. She had an office. She didn't have a job, but she had an office to do her creative work in. I, I was always confused by that. Um, but good for her. But, you know, she'd be like, well, I, you know, hey, but I got to go. I have to go uh, sharpen my pencil because I'm doing creative work right now. So I got to keep the pencil sharp. Talk to you soon. And I could never figure it out. And eventually things got bad enough in our relationship that I started talking to a therapist. And of course that was at her recommendation, which means it was not going to work out. You have to do that because you want to do it, not because you want somebody else to be happy that you're doing it. Anyway, I started talking to this therapist. I said, she always wants to get off the phone. I don't understand it. (laughs) My... The therapist I was talking to basically said, well, that was how she talked, like um, like a character from the Jack Benny show. <clears throat> well, do you call her too much? It was, it was very accusatory. And so I finished seeing that therapist after that encounter because that's how I deal with problems is to run away. Anyway, I don't remember how this came out, but eventually it came out that this woman that I was living with, that I was very much in love with, that I wanted things to work out with, and I had some inkling that they would, which they didn't. She was great. She still is. But 
you know, we weren't the right people for each other. I wasn't right for her. She wasn't right for me. It was destined for failure. Whatever the case, she had read a book called The Rules. And The Rules was written by two women, and it was about how to get and keep a man. It had all these tips about what you were supposed to do to psychologically manipulate a person into being more attracted to you. Basically, it was about how do you trap a guy into marrying you? Um, you know, now, this was long before there was the thing about like, tell me three things about you, two truths and a lie or whatever, you know, the game and the, the mystery method. Uh, this was a woman's way of, of, you know, getting this guy to be completely devoted to her. And one of the things they said was as a rule, if your guy call, you know, because it was the rules, if your guy calls on the phone, pretend that you're busy. That will, he will be so intrigued by that. You will be a woman of mystery. He will find you fascinating. He will be, he will be so interested that eventually you will be able to trick him into <laughs> proposing to you, marrying you, and you will both live happily ever after as long as you keep uh, hanging up on him every time he calls you. Anyway, it completely, the whole thing backfired. Now I'm by myself. I'm in lockdown and I have been trying to call my parents every other day, not succeeding, but I've been trying, I've been making an effort to call them every other day. They are, they are both, uh, of a certain age and that age is elderly and we all know that this plague tends to victimize the elderly more um you know and and i i also feel like what what do they have to do like they <laughs> it, it concerns me that they have so much time to kill um <clears throat> you know they watch tv they they watch they were like oh we watched unorthodox it was great my father loves uh, uh, Father Brown mysteries. I don't even know what that is. He goes, oh, Father Brown, they're very simple, but they're very pleasant, which apparently is a good quality in a, in a murder mystery. Very simple and very pleasant. Um, anyway, I call to check in to see how they're doing. And I've never been good about, you know, calling them on a regular basis. In, in normal times, I talk to them two or three times a month, maybe. So over the course of the, this past month, I've talked to them way more than I have in the previous, uh, I don't know, 40 years, honestly. Uh, and be, by the way, I say 40 years because that would go back to when I was just, uh, when I was about 12, which is when I started speaking in complete sentences. Uh, so anyway, I'm talking to them yesterday and my father says to me during the course of the conversation, Oh, we watched Unorthodox. It was great. My father Brown, very pleasant murder. And my father goes, so uh, have you been talking to anybody else? And I said, yeah, you know, I talked to people, a couple people and whatever. And the conversation meanders a little more. And then my dad brings it up again. He goes, uh, so have you been talking to anybody besides us? And my first reaction is, oh my God, does, do, do they think, do, this is clearly a thing they would have discussed. Do they think that I am calling them all the time because I have no one else with whom to speak? Which, you know, that makes me uncomfortable that they would think that of me. But then it hits me like, I don't know, a ton of, a ton of feathers, which is just as bad as a ton of bricks because, you know, a ton is a ton, no matter, you know, which is heavier. Anyway, with all the time they have to kill, maybe they ran out of unorthodox episodes in Father Brown mysteries. Is he trying to imply that they are too busy to talk, that I should call someone else? Did my parents read and misinterpret the Rules, the late 90s book on how to get and keep a man. I guess I'll ask them the next time I speak with them tomorrow. 
Certain things come up over and over on this show. Eat right, sleep, exercise on a regular basis. Recently, we've talked about mindfulness with a mindfulness expert. We've talked about clutter with a clutter expert. Today's guest is an expert on many things, but not those. But we got into both of them from her perspective and some other stuff too. Kulap Vilaisak is the creator and showrunner of a television program called Bajillion Dollar Properties, which is a hilarious show. All four seasons are available on Pluto TV. Uh, Kulap also directed a documentary called Origin Story, which is about who she is, where she came from, and why she is who she is. And that is available on Amazon Prime. So yeah, we talked about a lot of stuff. We recorded the episode in early December. So the first thing we talked about was Kulop's work as a soldier in the war on the war on Christmas. I feel like I put the tree up early November. <laughs> Wow. The tree tree got put up and I was like, everyone, was, friends were coming over. They were making fun of me. Rightfully so. Because your tree was already up. Yeah. And then I was like, look, I'm not going to. They were gonna. like, are you voting today? And why is your tree already up? <laughs> yeah. And then they, I, I said, you know what, guys, I'm not, I'm not an insane person. I'm not going to decorate it till after Thanksgiving. Right. And that happened what well, week before Thanksgiving. You just had fully. a bear tree up until I, then? I had a bear tree with lights. Oh, so it was slightly decorated. Well, I mean it's an artificial tree, so it was ready to go. Oh, it's already the lights are already on. There. Yeah, so I'm just hitting a remote control. <laughs> which can <laughs> I don't even understand how that works. There's new there's new technology yeah, in terms yeah. of trees. And so I my tree from Balsam Hill, which looks so realistic. Uh-huh easy to put together right uh there's three settings of lights you can go white oh classic right classy tree you can go color because that's who i am really in the inside just very colorful or you a mixture of both white and white and color yes mm -hmm. and I, I you don't want to mix your colors with your whites because that causes problems Mostly for the whites. Mm -hmm. you know. Segregation, yeah. What are we talking about? Uh, the, this year I look back, a lot of great things happened. I put out a documentary that is very raw and autobiographical, mm. exposing myself. And it, it, it's called Origin Story. It's available on Amazon and anywhere you can get anything. And that was this her Herculean task at every step of the way from conception to production to post-production and to getting it out and sharing it with the world. You made something and it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work and it finally came out after like five years, wow. right? So it finally came into the world and kind of like a song became, it was mine and then it became... Everybody's. Yeah. But again, it's on Amazon where people can <laughs> can claim it. <laughs> but a lot of people use that as their prom documentary, right? Like... <laughs> Same way people use songs sometimes. Yeah, yeah. My for graduation, my song was "Closing Time," and, and I expect everyone who graduates this year to play one hour and forty six minutes <laughs> of origin story. Of your documentary. <laughs> That's right. Uh -huh. That's right. Um, you can slow dance to it. I guess it's like sort of like a marathon, a marathon dance competition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and whoever drops off. So this was a real labor of love on your part. You put real a lot of yourself of into it. Yes, yes. And so great rewards in that. I feel great about it. There's also been concurrently just, it's also probably in those five years, a real struggle with getting pregnant and miscarriages. And one, I just miscarried for the sixth time. Mm. And just like, all right, how am I dealing with this? Right. How, do, how do I feel about oh, this whole situation having you know how do i feel about my body how do i feel about my prospects right how do i get to be a mother is it in the cards for me there's lots so there's this like you know i've i've really come to this place where i fall down seven and i get back eight and like mm -hmm. how how much how many I times do, do you keep getting up yeah. how do i and at one point in my you know i'm thinking am i am i pushing something that's not supposed to be and there's no, and just some backstory on that, there's no, we don't know why. Right. Well, 
oh, maybe it's because these embryos weren't, these ones weren't tested, but I did put one that was tested, didn't work out. All right. Uh, and, and can I, um, because I don't, I don't have a lot of knowledge about that, <clears throat> but are there, are there, I don't know what, statistics or anything about all that stuff that yeah. are either reassuring or not reassuring or just inconclusive or it's more inconclusive yeah. okay so as i you know i'm going to be 40 in may mm -hmm. things just uh, if i i'm a geriatric pregnancy right when you know if i have one when i have one so that things things are tougher mm -hmm. uh, in terms of you know my stats is you know we did uh, let's see we transferred five embryos I've been pregnant three times, so that's good statistics. Good, all things considered. But and then I did three, three other before. But so you know, it's hard to say. Right. It's inconclusive. It really I, is. I, I guess I only, I only ask because I feel like that's a thing that people just don't talk about. And yes, absolutely. That when it happens yeah. for women, they. My experience with people I know that have had that experience is they feel very much like, oh, this is just me, where yes. it turns out that is not the no. case. It it really isn't. And that's why I I'm I am I wanna talk about it mm -hmm. because it's not talked about, you know, and I I had my first was a, a natural pregnancy and then one was through IUI, maybe two were through IUI, another natural and then two from from i can't even keep track anymore from right. in vitro i've done so much and mm -hmm. it's not it's so involved when you go that route of ivf and and you know it's 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 my husband scott giving me shots so some people don't have that by the way some people are giving themselves shots and they're not small shots yeah sean and and my body has been coarse the hormones just coursing through and there's ups and downs when you get pregnant Generally, it feels like awesome. Right. And that's part of it. You know, it's like you feel great. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, things great. There's maybe a little bit of a fog, but you feel great. And then when you miscarry, generally it just crashes. That mixture of progesterone and estrogen just crashes. And then it sucks on top of like the so mind. So it's literally thing. like a physiological depression on top of yes. mental, emotional depression. Yeah. 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 And it's like, man, and this last one was tough because what I hadn't reached until this last time was a heartbeat. Mm. Just never got to a heartbeat. And we did. And it was strong. And we were moving forward and things were great and it was the longest I'd been pregnant and then it just didn't work mm -hmm. out again. And we don't know why. Right. And so I'm in a place of, when did this happen? This happened in November. <laughs> So you see where it connected with the... So let's put the tree up. <laughs> let's put the tree up. Yeah. Scott said, I can't have another dog. I've tried that angle. We have mm -hmm. two already. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, so let's put the tree up. Let's, let's let let's put the tree stuff. up and hit the remote. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. I'm like, right now, I'm going blue. I'm going for the I was going to say, can you? is there something you can hit where it go, where it alternates? Or do you have well, to do it me. manually? And it, it feels fine to be able to have that mm -hmm. control. <laughs> right. Now I feel in color. <laughs> now I'm feeling this. Yeah, so I don't know what we're going to... I'm giving myself some time. I don't know what we're going to do. Well, if we're going to start up with the whole rounds of retrieving eggs, I don't know. I'm probably mm -hmm. going to switch a doctor just because, even though my doctor's awesome. But right. it's like there's a little bit of PTSD when uh, you go... You just, that, the, it, you just associate things. Right, you walk in, you're like, ugh, hey. Yeah, because there's the positive of like, like, oh, wow, we're praying. You hear the heartbeat. Look, here, mm -hmm. here's a printout. And then you go in, and there's just been too m many times when I've gone in, and the the ultrasound happens, and it goes in, and there's it's just... Bad news. Nothing's there. Mm -hmm. It's just gone, and you're like, right. ah. And it's just been too many times. So it might yeah, be just I for energy. It. Switch it up, you know? Right. And, and, and you know... We all know that medical procedures to begin with, any involvement with any of that stuff is a nightmare. Yeah. And then to add this emotional component is that much worse. Yeah. Yeah. 
earlier in Feb, we I found out that I had heart shaped uterus, which sounds awesome, mm-hmm. and a Nirvana song. <laughs> Oh, wait, no, it's heart-shaped box. So, so... Which I believe uh, is below the uterus. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's right. Mm-hmm. I, it was like this. I had a septum, and I shaved it back. So, like, it got shaved, and mul- we had to go in twice to just shave it back to hopefully make some room, and maybe that's why the uh, embryos hadn't attached. But really, generally what happens there is just, just, just less room mm-hmm. for a kid to kind of grow into, right. basically. But then I, I had to say that, and, and then we cleared out some polyps. We just, like, there was, like... S- a lot of medical procedures. Yeah, but that it was decluttering my uterus. And just like Marie Kondo. Decluttering you. That's right. This is not sparking joy. The septum did not spark joy. Yes. Yep. Yep. And I'm looking. I'm going to look at that website. I know she's selling stuff now. (laughs) Maybe she's got like, you know, a jade tip septum. I'll put it back in. Maybe that's what it was just the wrong fleshy kind. If we're going to talk about clutter, let me ask you, do you feel like you've had issues with that ever? Or is Because I know some people are so organized all the time that it's yeah. never even something they think about. I definitely am someone who feels like my exterior is a telltale sign of my interior. Mm-hmm. So I do like throwing things away. I do like things being things. I do feel like things have a place. And putting, yeah, putting things away, it just, it, it does it clear mirror to my state of mind. Mm-hmm. You know, my bed does not, rarely gets made unless someone's coming over and is going to walk through. But I like to, yeah, I like to keep things like tidy. See, I'm such a slob, <laughs> but I make my bed every morning. Really? Yes, yes. What does that say about us? That's so interesting. Because I always feel like... <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but it's like I want to be all the way out. I don't want to ever uh, like, I, like I feel like I'm somehow still attached unless I. Yes, you seal it. Yes, you the seal. The cover is on. Yep, yep. And now I'm you out. You twisted the yeah. Okay, I get that. Right. I don't want to try to drink the water and find no. Um, <laughs> you and drinking water. <laughs> but I, but I, but I do. I feel like if I do that, then I am fully in the world as opposed to. Halfway there and halfway not. Talk to me about your home. What do, what do we got on the floor? What's going on? Oh, there's stuff all over the place. Uh-huh. Piles of mail, piles of shoes. I mean, you know, I have, I, I've talked about this. I have papers that I wrote when I was a freshman in high school that I still have. Wow. I've lived in 15 places since then. I don't know how I still have those, but yeah. somehow I do. Yeah. I did I did bring some things in to somebody who was a clutter expert and figured out that there are some things I need to get get rid of. But you knew that before. You didn't need that clutter expert. But to... but, but I feel like there's different like differentiating between oh, what okay. are the things I need to hold on to and what are the things. In fact, okay. here, here, here's a question for you. So I did a, another podcast cuz you can never have too many podcasts mm-hmm, speaking of mm-hmm. clutter. There's no <laughs> such thing as a podcast, it's not a good idea. But I did, <laughs> uh-huh. I did a show based on clutter. I mean, not not technically, but I had a thing in my house that I'd had for a long time that has a long backstory to it. But it was a photograph of my grandfather with noted former NFL running back. O.J. Simpson ah. autographed by O.J. Simpson to my grandfather. So, wow. like I said, there's a long story to that, but I'm kind of glad I still have that. I've kept it around. Yeah. And the podcast I did with Andy Daly was called The Great American Cabinet of Curiosities. And it was basically my idea was everybody has something in their house yeah. that they're like, this is, if people saw this, they would be like, why do you have this? The Nazi dish. The Nazi I didn't know that was what you had. Mm, that's not what I have, but that's what I... That <laughs> but yes. when, right when you said that, I was like, that's what it is. Right. Like, why... Yeah. Any Nazi m- memorabilia, why do you have that? Right. Do you have anything... Like that? ...that you can think of that's like, oh, I have this for this reason, even though it might not make sense to other people? 
And if somebody came to you and said, you need to get rid of that, you would be like, no, I'm not doing that. And if you don't, that's well, probably because you're mentally healthier than... Uh, you know, my... Okay, the one thing... Okay, the things that I think I'm thinking of right now is... I have... Sorry to be a downer. Here it goes. Uh, but my, my dear friend Harris Whittles passed away. Mm-hmm. And so I was part of a group of friends uh, who helped his family clear out his house. And right. so I just have things of Harris's. I just have... Uh, Stuff to remember him by. Yeah, yeah. But I, like... I think I took, like, at least three bags of stuff i have clothes i have you still have a lot of stuff yeah it's not like you were like let me let me hold on to harris's nazi dish (laughs) Uh, so anytime yeah i didn't do that (laughs) anytime i look at when i when i polish that dish i just think of my dear friend harris it gleams it Uh, gleams the the memory of his Uh, no but you took a (laughs) bunch you took a bunch of stuff to to just hold on to yeah and And some of the stuff i decided like uh, like just like i have like i have like there was just a bag of clothes that i remembered him from and so in uh, what i decided to do recently was put some of those clothes in I kickbox. I don't know if you know that. And I put it in my hanging bag. Like I put it in there because you stuff it with like sand and old clothes and stuff. Oh, so I, I see. Put, so I put some of his clothes there. They're in the bag yeah. that you kick. Yeah, the bag that I and kick. And box. Exactly. So that that was like, it okay. It took the- me. I, yeah, I'm glad you explained that because when you said I put it in my I kickbox and yeah. I put it in my hanging bag, in my head I was like, I don't see how those two things are connected because to me, yeah. hanging bag is just a piece yeah. of luggage. And now I'm thinking, is that the right word? <laughs> that's that's what <laughs> no. It I'm, makes total sense. I get it now. My hanging punching bag. My hanging punching bag. Well, but I do kick it too. Mm-hmm. My kick and punching bag. My kick and punching bag. <laughs> My kickboxing fill. bag. My kickboxing bag. But if you said kickboxing bag, I would still think it was a bag for like with my gear equipment. in it. Equipment. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, yeah. I'll never know. And but, I won't look but it so up. it's it's there inside this. Yeah, uh, with other stuff too. But mm-hmm. like, cause I, you know, I, I was like, I just can't. Like, one of the sweatshirts like I would wear, but like, there's some stuff. I'm just like, what am I doing with clothes? Right. But on top of that, I still have like, I have, uh, you know, uh, a brass bowl. Like, there's some stuff that I think my husband Scott has no idea that was in Harris's mm-hmm. house. I have like a small frame photo I have, of a painting. I have like, it, there's just random stuff. And then, I mean, I think people would understand why I have it. But like, right. I was like, I'm not going to put out this picture I have of my beloved past dog that Harris is holding, you know, like, Mm -hmm. it's just like, I'm not gonna put that out. And like, I just moved to a new house, not display it. Should I put it in the garage? No, I can't put it in the garage. I'm just gonna put it in my desk uh, drawer. (laughs) Like we're slowly gonna figure out, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, so it's in your desk drawer and you'll see it every once in a while and you will be. Yeah. Sad and happy at the same time. Yeah, generally sad. And then also, like, my dog, Rocky, speaking of, like, he... I used to do this uh, podcast called Two Treader for seven years, and listeners would just make him... Would make art of of him. Just, mm-hmm. like, he was a, a popular Who Treader figure. And so I've been letting that stuff go, too. Of like, well, I don't need to have, you know, this oil painting. <laughs> like... I have stuff that I have put up. There's when I tell you, there's just so much mm-hmm. stuff. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna pair things back. So pairing things back and letting things go, like that's like been my last 15 years. Right. It's been in, in this documentary I was telling you about. It's everything's connected. Like me letting go of the past. Me not hanging on to my anger. Me like trying to become a present being and not sit here with you and be thinking about my past or, Mm -hmm. you know, being afraid that you'll hurt me by, so I'll shift the tone of my voice Mm -hmm. and I'll, you know, like breaking, I mean, this last 15 years has been breaking myself down and like building myself up. So this sort of, cluttering and letting it's all a physical manifestation of the internal work that i've been doing Mm -hmm. and sometimes what happens is i'm hoping that the external will lead to the internal when i'm having trouble 
So if I clean stuff up, it maybe will help me like have a better day. Right. I'm just trying things out, you know, sometimes working, I'm generally working out feels great and it does, it's good for me and I kickbox because it's the one thing that I don't get bored at and it's so like satisfying. It's mm -hmm. just like, you know, you hit something, it feels like you're hitting, it's just so immediate. And I know that when I don't work out, I don't feel so great. Mm -hmm. And then there be long stretches where I don't work out. And yet, and yet, even though I know what will make me feel better. That is a weird thing about, about yeah. working out is like, it does automatically, because of your physical response, it yeah. automatically makes you feel better. And yet. And yet. The other thing we're going to talk about a little bit is mindfulness. Yes. And I feel like that kind of uh, uh, fits in there. So so tell me about that. Like what what cuz this is one thing that I have been not struggling with but just trying to figure out is what do people mean when they talk about mindfulness? It's such a weird And I think people mean different things. Yeah. I was thinking about that on the way here cuz I'm like, okay, mindfulness. You know, I went I went to uh what I will call a rich lady camp, which is the Miraval in Arizona, it's a resort, mm -hmm. and you know, like a spa kind of place. Yeah, yeah, but they also like I say rich lady camp because like there's also classes. The big part of it is like the classes that are available to mindful eating. Mm -hmm. I took a, I paid a little extra to to essentially scoop shit off of a horse's hoof right. because you know it's hard to get into that class. It's hard you to know? get into that class. Some of the people I went yeah. to college with actually majored in that, and it turned out to be kind of a useless major. Yeah, uh, you know, I, it was taught by a man who's written a book called It's Not About the Horse. <laughs> and, Sean, it's so stupid. Mm -hmm. I, I'll always go first, even if I'm – that's just something. I'll always go first, even if I have no idea what I'm doing. So right. when there's 10 of us who've gone to a stable with a man who looks like Do you have, do you have like siblings? Santa. Do you have siblings? I, I am the oldest. I was going to say, you're yeah, the oldest, aren't I'm you? The oldest, That's why you yeah. go first. I'll yeah. just go first. And it's like eight people, and they're like, who's going to go first? All you have to do is like basically poke a horse in its hind, like in its leg, just in a certain place by its knee. Mm -hmm. It's going to kick its leg up, and you just clean it up. And I uh, Literally the it. shit out Literally of it. Literally shit. Hoof. That's all you have to do. You took the hoof. That's the whole thing. I And he said, like, it's going to be hard for you. And I'm like, I am this. And then I'm like, because I think that I'm a mon At the time, I thought of myself as, like, a monster and something that, like, I was so afraid of hurting the horse. I mm -hmm. wouldn't, I just wouldn't hit it the right way. And I just would get frustrated. And I'm doing this in front of people. And I'm like, he's like, why just do the thing? Like, what, mm -hmm. why do you, why can't you do it? And I'm just like, I don't know, maybe it's this, it's that. It was so crazy. It was so simple. And when I finally got it to do it, I was like, oh, my God. And then I proceeded. It's just this tool that you just scrape it. And then I was so happy the to do it. The hoof shit scraper. It's the hoof called. shit scraper. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're just supposed to just that's all you're supposed to scrape it. Not onto you like I did. Not completely upon my These chest. things happen. <laughs> just like, yeah, I did it. He's like, you didn't it's have to process. It's learning. put it on your sweater. Yeah, yeah. Um, learning. Again, tears. Mm -hmm. Tears. That's why you do it at Rich Lady Camp. Rich Lady Camp. Miraval. Miraval. Yes, Gail and Oprah have gone, <laughs> and that's the only reason why I knew about it. Uh -huh. Okay, so, but they talk about mindfulness. That's what it is, right? right? So in terms of eating, it's like, am I hungry? Am I am I not walking? Am, am I, is my head and my body connected? And I would used to get weird bruises because I'm running into things. I'm literally running into things because my mind is like, not connected to my body. I'm not paying attention to my surroundings. I'm like, gotta get up, gotta go that direction. Who cares if like I swing into the side? I'm not connected. I'm just sort of, you know, I'm using my body as like just a transport and not, you know, a big part of the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem of, of, of my being. And then when it comes to food, am I hungry or am I just like, I, what I know is that I definitely self-soothe with food I have mm -hmm. for the longest. Not uncommon. Not uncommon. So that's really connected. Like 
am I tasting my food? Am I on my phone while I'm eating? Am I not like, am I, am I multitasking too much? You know, am I taking in each action? Mm -hmm. And then I think for me, that mindfulness banner, what, how I manifested is taking personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. Right. So I grew up in a very dysfunctional family and my my and my parents they taught me a lot of great things certainly hard work as uh, refugees from Laos my mom opened a restaurant and bought a home within five years of being in this country mm-hmm. that's tremendous and amazing they are war survivors and there's a lot of it wasn't I'd say a safe place to grow up I l- always in fed. your family yeah I always fed I had a roof over my head but the other stuff there's mm-hmm. you know. And so they weren't great models of like personal responsibility. It was always kind of like somebody else. And when uh, there was a lot of victimization and there was a lot of, so for me, like mindfulness is about being personal responsible, being personally responsible for what I do. Mm-hmm. I can't, oh, I've tried so hard to control other people. <laughs> I've tried so hard to like fix my mom and my parents' marriage and mm-hmm. my dad and, you know, just try to manipulate people so that they won't like hurt me and there's a lot of energy that's gone out in that direction i've tried to fix your parents marriage and i feel like i've had even less success than well you. they they got a divorce mm-hmm. so well, just take it as a go. failure yeah could you <laughs> mm-hmm. again <laughs> okay sorry you did i guess i was just really feeling it yeah <laughs> that palpable anger that i have <laughs> that I described <laughs> to you earlier. <laughs> yeah, so, look, I am trying, like, when I get, and I still get frustrated sometimes when people don't do what they say they're going to do or they don't do what I told them to do, which is even great on the ego level. Um, like, what, what, have, what have I done on this side of the podcasting <laughs> table and what could I improve upon and what, do I need to own up to? And what, like, even though I'm like, oh, man, righteous anger. Oh, is it righteous, though? You know, it's like I'm doing all these sort of, like, inventory. So to me, in the long, very scenic route, to answer your question, <laughs> is that to me, for me, is, like, mindfulness is about personal responsibility. And you're saying personal responsibility, but I feel like part of also what you're saying, and you did say this, is not – feeling like you can or should or are able to control other people and that you can't you can then absolve yourself of responsibility for their actions in some way yeah so that it's not as frustrating or angering or upsetting yeah i used to when i back home because it, w- when I was growing up, I, I, I'd have to, in, after school, I'd go in to the house and I'd really have to take in what was happening, right? Am I going to get in trouble? Is there a lie I need to tell? Is there a, is, do I need to continue a lie? Uh, are they going to be angry at me? Are they fighting amongst themselves? So it was a constant, just darti- eyes darting, looking, doing math in my head, thinking about outcomes, various outcomes, and what's the outcome where I don't, you know get slapped across the face what how what is the how do i survive this day you know Mm -hmm. and that kind of continued years after i moved out of that house and i kind of mentioned it earlier too of like when i started to realize the things that i do and all the energy i put to to as i described try to get you to like i want you to like me i want you to not feel threatened by me because i think i'm saving you from the monster that I am, which is also super ego driven, by the way. And also people have their own will and their choices. They can do whatever they want. But but that would come out as like my voice my voice would get higher and like, yeah, so how are you? 
like, how, oh my God, yeah, you told me about your sister. How, how is she? Is everything okay? And then you, you had that job. Like, that's so cool. And oh, me? Oh, you know, things are fine. Like, I'm fine. Not important. Not important. And I wouldn't allow, it got to a point in my 30s when I realized, like, you don't have a lot of intimate relationships. Mm-hmm. So not a lot of intimate relationships with women because I was so afraid. Your voice of, like, got very low there. Yes. With women. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And when I let my voice drop to what it really, really is, mm-hmm. you know, like that, this is my voice. But like for the longest, people on the phone are like, is mom and dad there? I'm like, no, I'm 24. <laughs> like, because they felt like you were doing that because you were in front of your parents. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? Or just that my voice was just so high, they thought I was a child. Oh, I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I get it. So people who didn't know you thought you were a child. Yeah, like on the phone and stuff. Yeah. And just let, like, you know, let my ovaries drop a little bit to this, to this gorgeous. Sultry. (laughs) Sultry voice i have now almost a almost a kathleen turner i was just gonna bring it up (laughs) i was i was like i was thinking like warchowski that movie and i'm trying to pull what is her name what is that movie that's so funny that that's the movie of hers that you referenced i know i was trying to pull her name because i'm like i've been thinking about kathleen turner lately anyways (laughs) she was a huge star yeah like a massive body heat no i mean warchowski too but (laughs) Body, I think Body Heat was a bigger, huh? a bigger you. in the cultural zeitgeist. <laughs> tell me about tell me about kickboxing. How did that start? I think it's like uh, like fighting. As and physical violence have just always been in the family. <laughs> and some would say it was a good, it's an extension of that, you know. How how did I start? You know, I mean, I've always, and I've also always loved action and martial arts films. Mm-hmm. And and then I think, you know, I have tried Wing Chun Kung Fu. I've tried, but if kickboxing is sort of what started. And I've done it now probably Is it something for, you've always done? Or? Yeah, 10 plus years uh-huh. now. Pretty solidly for the last, I would say, six or f- six years, five years. You know, I do it probably at least two to three times a week. And yeah, enough so that I have my own hanging bag, kick mm-hmm. kick punch bag. <laughs> Whatever we're calling it. I don't know. <laughs> Heavy bag. You're right. Heavy bag. <sighs> yeah, mm-hmm. obviously it's called a heavy bag. Yeah, anyways, I've been doing it for seven years and I can't pull heavy bag. <laughs> Didn't have it. Didn't have it. Yeah, so it's something where I feel like I had a natural ability and it is some, you can always improve your skills. Mm-hmm. And so it challenges me in that way. But even if I have a, I'm having like a crap day, like, and I just, I can't do a, you know, I can't, my knees aren't going to let me do a jump. I can still just like something so satisfying about like executing like a shin kick. That's just, it's basic. I love a good shin kick. A good shin kick, Mm -hmm. you know, where I just basically can just, I'm just going to try to bilaterally cut across someone's body. And that's very. You just want to shin kick that hanging bag. (laughs) That's very satisfying. Yeah, yeah I, did it, I did it this morning with the trainer. It was great. Well, to go back to what you were talking about before with cleaning the horse's hoof <laughs> and having such difficulty with that, clearly that was a moment where you had so many other things going on in your head. Do you feel like the kickboxing stuff, you're able to get rid of all that excess yeah. stuff and yes. just be there? It's a physical meditation. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, and I think it's like if I don't focus up, especially when I'm doing mitt work and stuff, I'm gonna get hit. <laughs> like, especially if you're doing what work? Mitt work. If mitt like work. my okay. my friend Kendra, one of my best friends, she she's my trainer, mm-hmm. and so I'm punching her, and she's holding mitts, right? And if she's like coming at my face, if I'm not paying attention, I'm we're gonna make contact. She's gonna hit you. She's gonna hit me, and mm-hmm. she's very strong. She was she trained the WWE, like you know, I mean, that's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt me, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. and so you just—that's the thing, and and you, you got know, a duck. 
you got a duck, you got you got a fane, you got a pole. stick and move, That's stick and move. Right, you know. And there was violence in my life, so I it it sharpens my sense senses. Mm-hmm. Like it's like oh, there's something's up. So I get really awake. I'm not multitasking. I'm not thinking about other things. I'm not on my phone. That would be it's impossible with the wraps and the gloves. But shot. what if you get a text? I, it's a struggle. <laughs> It's it's much. What like, if there's something interesting on Twitter? It's much like how you open the show with some vaudevillian <laughs> <laughs> physical work. You know. I love that. I love doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's uh, it's good, and it feels it's so. And I especially like to bring my my girlfriends to work out with me, mm-hmm. and I see them struggle. At the beginning, like I struggled again with that horse hoof, <laughs> like of like, but then when they get into it, it's like, no, like my friend's like six foot and she really can take a punch and a kick. It's like, kick her. Don't just tap her, you know, like really kick her and really try to go through her. There's this, I see my friends really like, there's this like Wonder Woman-esque, them scrying sort of like 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 a warrior like oh i can really do this yes and then it's such it's so beautiful i don't have to hold back anymore Mm, yes sean Mm -hmm. yes 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 and i can go for it and i have power and i'm strong i'm way stronger than i think i can Mm -hmm. and so it's in kickboxing it's so not about being polite right it's like my best moves are the ones that are just like they're just the the sh- they're, they're dirty and they're a little shitty. I love a backhand. There is nothing <laughs> polite about a shin kick. That's right. That is a great way to be rude to people. Yep, yep. Just a si- also a side kick to the knee. That can you be know, very damaging. Very damaging. I go for damage. Mm-hmm. I definitely go for damage. Now, do you ever spar with people? I've only sparred with Kendra. I am, you know, in my like, oh man, what if I did like a smoker? You know, like a smoker, yeah, right? Yeah. Now the sweet face, Sean. The sweet face. <laughs> <laughs> the sweet face. Yeah, but would you, wouldn't you wear headgear? Wouldn't you yeah, wear like man. a big face mask? And... Yeah, but if you're doing a smoker, it's not, you know. All bets are off? Yes. I mean, they're not all off. They still but... they still wear helmets in those smokers, no? no? Sometimes no. No. Okay. But even then, I mean, this is true. It's not like with my, my friend Kendra where she's not trying to hurt me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like this is real. Although I, again... The other part of me says I do okay. <laughs> yeah. But our our friend, our mutual friend, Eugene Cordero, he had to like, I think he he would do like sparring and stuff. And then he would go to an audition and like his manager got feedback because he'd be all like, like beat up. Yeah. It's like, What's dude, going what are, on with Eugene? What are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, I have to say, I feel like he's done all right despite that, you know. <laughs> That's true. That's <laughs> I true. just was I just was emailing him this weekend because I was watching. No, 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 no. Oh. Before that, I was just I had the mule on in the other room, and I just heard this voice, and I was like, "Holy shit!" And I went in, and there he was. And then on top of that, <laughs> there he is on Twitter from the Mandalorian. Anyway, yeah, I have a high school friend who trains MMA fighters over in the Valley, and he keeps on saying I should come to a smoker sometime. So, one of these days, would you ever train? I don't know. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, I'm I'm a little past my prime at this point you uh, know it's not about that uh-huh it's not about that i did do i did take a martial arts class in new york for a while yeah it's funny that you say that about like don't hold back yeah because this is why i stopped is it was a karate class and there was a the teacher was a guy i don't remember his name but he was kind of a tough you know tough guy whatever And he had an assistant come in one day. I guess she was training to be a teacher. It was a woman. And we were doing round kicks. And she was going to hold the shield and everybody was going to round kick her. And Mm. I was, you know, probably twice her size. So I pulled my kick. And she was like, no, 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 do it. Come on, do it. And I did. And she flew flew across the room and hit the wall. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. And she was like, no, no, no. That was exactly what you're supposed to do. You're right. You're right. I should have braced myself better. (laughs) Then I got up to the front of the line again. And I was like, I'm not going to. And she was like, no, no, no. And the same thing happened again. 
And the teacher got in my face and threatened me and said, you think you're a tough guy because you can kick that woman across the room? And I was like, no, no, no. Did he come in later? Like he didn't It see... wasn't in the class. No, no, oh. he, he was there when it happened. Oh. But at the end of class, he kind of came up to me and stuck his hand in my face I and was see. like, you think you're a tough guy? You think you can come in here and kick... And I was like, that's not what happened. You're, and then, so I was like, I'm done with this guy. I'm not yeah. going to do that anymore. But yeah, with that guy though. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was, what was I, a ninth degree black belt, I think, at that time? No, I'm kidding. I really wish you were a ninth degree. <laughs> I was like, my, you really let me down. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> no, I was just getting started. I was probably 50 classes in or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally, totally. Uh, but I yeah, watched, I mean, I get back at. <laughs> I just think it's so important. Like, I, I don't know. It's just what, what, what is either is physical training or yeah. or this particular type of physical training. Ah, if you have the inclination to do, I think you know a lot of people are not interested. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's okay, you know. I was going to say a lot of people do fencing, but I'm actually interested in fencing. Um, uh, but you Put it, have... Putting up fences. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Walls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Building walls. Right. <laughs> yeah. Build that wall. Build it. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, hi. <laughs> yeah, so you have an inclination. You enjoy it. I definitely it. have an inclination. And so that means there's like, you get, there's gratification and that problem, you have an aptitude for it. Like, mm -hmm. I would love for you to have, to have seen you you know kick Cynthia Rothrock across the wall like you did and that means Cynthia Rothrock <laughs> do you remember her? of course <laughs> the only female martial arts star of the 80s yeah and remember her like scorpion kick remember how it would yeah. come back her leg would uh -huh. come up and pop yeah <laughs> right in the head yeah I would have loved to have seen that mm -hmm. you know and I just think like I think it is it is it is physical I'm not great at meditating. I just, I try and I just, I'm not great at it, mm -hmm. you know? But that, I just, I get so much out of that movement. And there's something about control and power and like, you know, being able to to dance in that way, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a brutal dance. And I just think, but it makes me feel so good. So I would want you to feel good. <laughs> That's yeah, kind of I mean, the simplest the, of it. As, you, as, you're <laughs> like, as you're talking about it, I'm like, yeah, I wish I was still doing stuff like that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like I've had friends who I, I, maybe in the last two or two years, I started posting on Instagram like videos of me kickboxing. And I didn't think about it because I've been doing it prior to Instagram. My friend Kendra was like, you should post it. Show people mm -hmm. like what you're up to. And people's reactions have been really great. And I've been I've gotten people to start kickboxing and and you know of all different starting points and almost everybody was like i don't think i can do this i don't think you know mm -hmm. i'm worried about getting hurt i'm worried about you know and to like then to the people that it worked for their face light up yeah. and like really seeing how just how powerful you are mm -hmm. and i think some things there's just so much uh, that we can't control and doing something like this doing something that like makes you feel like good and makes you feel strong and powerful like why not do that and if yeah. there's only positives like i think it's great mm -hmm. after we recorded that interview kulop was kind enough to invite me to train with her in kickboxing so i went to her house where she has a whole dojo set up for herself. Uh, her friend Kendra was there, her trainer. And I I did some kickboxing with the two of them. It was amazing. I, I, I really loved it and honestly feel like I would love to do more. Uh, Kulop had filled Kendra in on my whole story with my martial arts experience and how I was renowned for uh, launching women across the room with my roundhouse kick. And Kendra, uh, who, who really is just a total badass, she was very encouraging that I should not be afraid of that. Um, she made me work my ass off. She made me punch hard. She made me kick hard. I was sore for days after that in a good way. 
uh, Kendra had that remarkable ability that a few great teachers, great senseis have of pointing out to me and correcting everything I was doing wrong while at the same time making me feel like I was doing everything right. Uh, you can follow Kulop on Twitter at Kulop, K-U-L-A-P, or follow her on Instagram at I am Kulop. I would even say you could do both of those things. The executive producer of Sean Conroy Gets Happier is Lauren Dunnitz. Our line producer is Pete Galamaga. The show was recorded at All Things Comedy Studios in Burbank, California. Our sound engineer is Aaron Brungart, who is also our video technician and wishes to be liberated. Please liberate Aaron Brungart. My name is Sean Conroy. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Sean Conroy. Thank you so much for listening. Keep your distance. Keep getting happier. And I will see you next week.